So I'm very happy to be talking today to James O'Callaghan, who's the High Performance Director for Irish Sailing. Uh, he's coached at four Olympic Games and numerous European and World Championship events across multiple Olympic classes. So hello, James. Hi, John. And I'm, you're in Spain right now, yes? That's right, yeah. I'm in a, a little town called El Puerto de Santa Maria, which is the other side of the bay from Cadiz, which most people probably do know. Brilliant. We'll get back to why you're in Spain in a bit. But first, I want to just sort of get through the sailing stuff because I don't really know that much about sailing. So you started off like in Trinity uh, studying business and economics. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, that's so right. So how did you get from <laughs> being a business and economics uh, graduate to being like the coach of the Irish sailing team? Yeah, it's, uh, I think my mother often asks that question as well, but um, no, I, uh, I, one of the final year subjects I did was a, was a subject called Organization Theory and Change, and I did a project on a conceptual company called Sailcoach, and I basically put it through the business school in Trinity as to how one would set up a business to manage people's Olympic campaigns, and uh I did very well in that project in particular, but then basically when I graduated, uh, myself and the, my business partner, a guy called Trevor Miller, set up Sail Coach. And Trevor was the kind of, I suppose it was his his idea conceptually because he had helped some of the smaller nations in the Atlanta Olympics and felt there was a gap in the market there for experienced coaches to help countries that didn't have any performance programs in place. Um, to pool the resources to bring in talented athletes from, in our case, it was uh, South Africa, the Seychelles and Slovenia was our, was our first sort of few countries that we started to work with. And uh, it really just grew from there. So did you have to train in coaching as well as the business side of it? or? Yeah, well, I was always, through college, I, I did my own Olympic campaign for Atlanta and um, I didn't qualify for Atlanta, but, you know, I was still competing at a very high level. And, and alongside that, I was doing my coaching qualifications in what was called then the, the, the Co National Coaching and Training Center down in uh, Limerick. So I, I was actually one of the first uh, coaches on their tutor course as well. So I've kind of always had an interest in coaching um, and did it sort of in parallel with when I was competing. Um, and I, I suppose... Well, it, in my own head, I originally was only really going to do this business thing for, for you know, one or two years to see how it went, um, <laughs> you know, and then I suppose the, the more well-beaten path after my degree was sort of you go over to the finance houses or the banking stuff in, in, in London, and that's the kind of the, the, the more commonly beaten track from, from a business economics degree in Trinity. But, um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I suppose it was... I mean, I was really enjoying it. And, and the sail coach, when we started sail coach, it was sort of 1998. And we got hooked into the whole dot com boom, ironically enough. Um, I mean, I, I was always quite good at the marketing side of things. But we, you know, because we had a website and we were getting lots of international customers, we ticked a lot of boxes with, um, you know, uh, funding agencies and business angels and investments and stuff like that. And, you know, when I look back now, it, it's kind of laughable like that. You know, we, we believed our own hype that we were a very successful business, but a lot of a lot of what we were, you know, a lot of the income that we were bringing in was actually grant aid. You know, and grant aid is is like a crutch that, if you do believe your hype, you know, you fall flat in your face pretty quickly. But, um, you know, the the company and the business itself was was a genuine business, and and it grew very quickly. We had. You know, at one stage we had 11 staff and we had, uh, you know, 22 boats and we, we had, we were working with over 30 different countries. Um, wow. And, we, you know, we, we took a team to the um, Sydney Olympics. So it was fantastic um, while we were doing it, but we, we weren't actually making any money, which, you know, when you're kind of fresh out of college, you're not really that concerned with sort of, I suppose, that side of things. But it was an amazing adventure. Um but then, you know, came, so I was doing that sort of three and a half, four years and realized that, you know, this was a difficult gig to, to make money in because the, those small countries generally don't have any funding either. So it was hard to make a, a decent living out of it. So at that stage then, um, 
we, like Sailcoach, we completely downsized it. So, you know, I, I left Sailcoach and, and Trevor, Sailcoach is still running. It's still a very strong brand. We always got the brand very, very strong. So that's still going. But I went into freelance coaching and I ended up then working with the German Federation, which would be one of the bigger federations in the Athens cycle. And then for the Athens Olympics, I actually worked with the international laser class to help, again, the smaller nations and then the laser class after, is the is the boat type, is it? Yeah, sorry, it's the yeah. there's ten there's ten different Olympic disciplines, and and laser is uh, one of them. And then, so that was then, you know, so I'd been doing coaching, I suppose, since college for you know six years, and then the sport in Ireland changed quite a lot. Um, post Sydney, the government started to realise that if they wanted to compete internationally, they were going to have to fund it, and they couldn't just rely on you know, the, the, the clubs and the sort of volunteerism yeah. in Irish sports. So it was kind of funny because when I decided to go down this road as a career, you know, the, my, that career didn't exist in Ireland. Um, so, you know, but six years after I started, it started to emerge that there was opportunities within Ireland. And the, and the landscape has completely changed now from, say, when I was even campaigning uh, as an athlete and, and when I started coaching, it's it's... You know, there's quite a lot of support there um, from government for, for sport. Yeah, and it started, it's paid off now because I read somewhere that since you've taken, since you've become the coach, the Irish team has done better than it's done in the last 30 years. Is that right? Yeah, we, we've certainly made a lot of progress. I mean, developing talent is, is slow because, you know, you're, you're, it's, it, you're developing humans, you know, you're developing their skill sets and stuff like that. So, you can't just come in and, and have an instant result. So we we put a lot of time in at the beginning to getting the structure and the systems right. And that was kind of, uh, I suppose, it's 10 years ago now I started. And, you know, we're now starting to see, you know, those sailors that we saw coming into the system 10 years ago when they were sort of, you know, 11 and 12 are now 21, 22, and they're starting to hit their sort of peak time for performing as an international athlete. So we're starting to see the benefit of that. And, and you know, even we had the, early glimpses of it in london which was, was which was fantastic yeah with the bronze wasn't it no we just missed bronze actually we were we were close but we were fourth in the end it was a oh, okay the, the final day there was uh basically four girls that you know could have oh, that's won, right yeah could have won right, gold yeah. silver or bronze and uh you know those four girls all finished in the top five in that race um, but unfortunately, Annalise was uh, was fifth, so it, it wasn't quite good enough. But I mean, it was still like exceeded our expectations for her at that Olympics. So um, there, there was an agonizing wait, wasn't there? Before we knew, I seem to remember that now. It's coming back to me. Well, it was just we, there was there was. I mean, the figures were quite astonishing for the viewing because the, the four hundred and twenty thousand people tuned into the medal race in Ireland to watch, yeah. and basically they watched the race, which takes you know approximately twenty minutes. But there was, you know, a lot of changing of positions. So, you know, at the first mark, Annalise was in gold medal position. At the next mark, she was out of medal position. Then she got back into gold medal position and then she fell out. So it was just neck and neck. So it was a real sort of cliffhanger of a race. Yeah. Um, but what, once the race was over, like we knew we knew the results straight away. Um, oh, OK. And um, so, but yeah, it was a uh, high drama. <laughs> Well, well done. Well done on what you're doing. It sounds, it's brilliant. Did, did you ever, like, I know you, when, when you, I assume like you had an interest in sailing and you, you be, be, uh, that led to your own uh, Olympic uh, campaign. But what, were you always interested in the Olympic kind of sailing or did you ever like want to do the sort of round the world on your own kind of thing or the big, you know, the big ocean races that you, that you, you see are hyped so much? Did that, were you ever interested in that? Or? No, no, actually, originally I wanted to be a sprinter. I thought I wanted to be, uh, I would, wanted to go to the Olympics as a 100 meter sprinter because I was always quite fast. So you like mean I, a runner? Yeah, 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 exactly. A hundred meter runner. Right. Because um, I was so trying I remember... to imagine in my head there a hundred meter sprint in a in a in a, in a, no, a sailing no, boat. <laughs> no, a hundred meter like sprint. I remember like as a kid being uh, in for the eighty four Olympics. So we, we were on. We used to holiday up in Donegal, and there was basically only one house with a TV, and I had prearranged that I would be able to go up to the house to watch the hundred meter final and watch Carl Lewis. Oh, okay. Um, so. 
you know, I, I had a, like, he would have been my kind of, I suppose, first sporting hero. And then as I got older, I kind of realized, okay, I'm probably the wrong skin color here to be a 100 meter sprinter. And, but I was always competitive in all sports. So, and then I grew up in Malahide and that's by the coast. And so we used to do the, the local sailing course in Malahide. But it's funny, I always liked the day racing because the, I mean, I have the, so much respect for the guys who do the big ocean racing. I just think, you know, the, the Volvo ran, ran the world races on at the moment. And, you know, in the old days it was the Whitbread. But uh, I just think there's a, that's a kind of a different level of insanity with that. It's, it's, I mean, it's <laughs> properly hardcore, uh, extreme, you know, man against nature kind of sailing. And so while I have huge respect for it and that, it never really... Uh, it never really appealed to me. I always preferred to go out, race and come home, you know, and it was short sort of sharp races where you're kind of ultra competitive with boats around you all the time. Whereas the, the Volvo ocean race, typically, you know, you're, you're out at sea for six weeks between legs and, you know, you mightn't see another boat. Although, although this year's edition is, is phenomenal in that they're all finishing, you know, within minutes of each other, having been out racing for three or four weeks. It's quite, quite wow. astounding. Um, but yeah, it's for for some. I mean, there's a there's a part of me that in the Southern Ocean where you have the huge waves and you get the awesome footage. I'd love to be helicoptered into that for two hours and you know ride the massive waves and you know then get out of there. But it, to get to the Southern Ocean, you have a long sail and then once you're there, you're there. You know, um, and yeah. so yeah, it's it's funny. And a lot of sailors do you know go that way as well. They they start off in dinghies and, and go into big boats, but I've always just sort of stuck with the dinghies and I've kind of veered a little bit over with the, with the kite surfing now. I do quite a lot of kite surfing, which technically is sailing as well. So, Right. And what kind of psychological training is involved for the sailors and the team? Like, do you go into that side of it a lot? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, because, you, you, I mean, if you think about it, all, all these people are highly skilled at what they do. So w what differentiates one from the other, you know, and it's a lot of the time it's to do with their mindset and their, you know, their, their mental skills and their capability to recover from knocks and, you know, managing their anxiety and, you know, even just trying to get into that zone where, you know, they're not even thinking about their decisions. They're into the flow state automatically. And how do you regenerate that uh, on a consistent basis? So, the mental side of things is a big part of the game. Right, the flow state. Now, what, what do you mean by that? Um, it's just, it's a term we use for when you're in a state where you're not actually consciously making your decisions. You know, you're just, you're just going out and doing what you do. And you often find you, you don't really remember what happened in the race. You just did it. Uh, you know, you, do, you don't necessarily consciously remember, okay, well, I went right here because of this or because of that it just everything is in a kind of you're in a zone where this all the decisions you're making are the right ones is that like the elite athlete version of when you drive to the shops and you don't remember driving there yeah exactly it's a, it's a simplistic version of it but yeah when you if you think about it you know you're everyone's so used to driving the car they don't consciously change gear. They know that they have to change gear if they're going up a hill, but they don't. Yeah, it's ex it's exactly like that. Uh, I suppose in a, in it with more complex decisions. Yeah, but I, and I also I imagine if you like had to go to the shops and there was a gold medal riding on it, it'd be very hard to not to forget what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like a you know the, you hear rock climbers talking about objective danger. You know so. They're, they're making a decision if they can jump from one ledge to another, you know, but if there's a hundred foot drop, drop between the ledge, all of a sudden it becomes a much bigger jump, you know, but the, the, the skilled ones are the guys who can block out because they can, they know they can, if that jump was at ground level, you know, a three-year-old could do it. Um, yeah, so uh, I totally, totally relate to that. I used to do rock climbing and we used to do, go rock climbing in Dorky Quarry yeah, and uh, I was brilliant in uh, Docky Quarry, and then we one day we went out to I think it was Logala in Wicklow. So I think it was maybe a thousand foot or yeah, two thousand foot. Really simple climbing, and my God, I was petrified. I practically froze up. Right? Yeah, and and it's yeah. just exactly what you're talking about uh, of just the 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 
there's so much more <laughs> riding on every little thing that you do that is uh, everything's amplified. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, what the, do you? How do? You, how do you? What kind of thing do you do to teach that? How do you train someone to get into the flow state? Well, we we work with sports psychologists. We, one of the things is habit, and you know, and, and also then the tr- the training and the re- repetition gives you the confidence to know that you can do it. So that so that you do, it's easier to get into that state. But I mean, one one of the difficulties with the Olympics is it only comes around every four years. So there's very few other events that we have that you can simulate the Olympics. Um, so it it is a, it is a big challenge whereby. You know, we're a minority sport. We don't get that much coverage, um, you know, between Olympiads. And then all of a sudden you've got the Olympics and, you know, the whole country is behind you, which is fantastic. You know, it's brilliant, but it brings its own sort of pressures. So, you know, as the sort of management team and the coaches, we're trying to make the athletes aware of, look, this is what this is what you can expect. So it's trying to remove all those surprises. But it's also just, uh, you know, a big part of it would be visualization where you're sort of, you're, you're, you've got sort of visualization drills where you're going through what what you know and what to expect and what you'll do if you do this, what you'll do if you, if this happens. So it's just, it's just right. You see, you see the you see the skiers doing that at the top of the yeah yeah. And you see the uh, sprinters as well. They're standing the up there and they're up. like moving their hands yeah. like they're yeah. you know they're skiing down it in their mind. Yeah. yeah. You see you see sprinters doing the same. They're looking down the track and you know you, their eyes are very focused and they're you know that's what they're doing. You know. Um, right. So, so visualization. Do they do uh, meditation as well, or is that that what what you mean by the visualization? Or is yeah, some of them do. It's a, it's an interesting one. I mean, we we don't have it, you know, as like the psychologists that we're working with at the moment wouldn't be using meditation. But like my own my own sailing career, I I did a lot of uh, meditation. I worked with um, a lady called Felicity Heathcote who had spent. I don't know, 15 years or something in Japan. So she, she, we were just sort of doing Zen uh, meditation uh, to, to basically get us into the flow state. And I found it very useful, but it's a kind of thing that's horses for courses as well. You have to kind of find what works for you. There's no kind of one, uh, one solution for everybody, you know? Yeah. And do you find you still do the Zen meditation yourself? Has it stayed with you? It's something, no, it hasn't. Um, I, I do it occasionally, but it's one of those things that I go, I must do that again um, because I really found it beneficial. Um, so it's it's kind of, it's still in my toolbox, but I haven't used it for a while, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the time when I was competing, I was I was pretty pretty good at it. Like, I mean, I used to practice it every day. So, um, and it's just, you know, it's simple breathing exercises really. So, um, if I do find that I'm getting particularly stressed, you know, I will sort of just sort of take some time out and, and do a bit of breathing. Um, but I don't, it's something that I keep saying, oh, I must get back into that routine. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it's something that needs practice, you know, it's not, well, I, yeah. for me anyway, I, I, fe- I felt that way that it's, it's, it, it's something that, you know, you do it on a daily basis and then you really see the benefit of it. And how much physical training is involved for the sailors? Because I don't really know. Like, what, I know you were you were you were saying about having to lean out, but do they have to be really physically fit? Yeah, as well? they, they do in the small boats, and that's that's the big difference. The the small boats basically the body weight is what's you know controlling the trim of the boat. So you know the simple physics of it are that the the wind blows on the sail, and then the body. You know, if the body wasn't there, the boat would, you know, capsize. But the body's there and flattens the boat. So that's a, that's a force against the wind. And right. basically that drives the boat forward, that those two kind of um, op- opposing forces. And that could be, you know, that could be quite physical when you when you bring in waves and everything that like else into it. Um, and it, obviously the windier it gets, the more physical it is. But the guys would be... Uh, basically as fit as your kind of British Academy level cyclists, you know, so they'd be right up there in terms of their VO2 and their, their, um, what, what's strength. VO2? Uh, so their, their ability to take oxygen in to feed the muscles basically. Um, All right. So they, they would be doing a lot of fitness, um, as part of the program. And what kind of things do you do for that? Like, 
Do you have, have an exercise program for them? Yeah, we have a full time uh, strength and conditioning uh, coach who, who is also a physio. So they're they're all on um, you know individualized programs. So they would have pretty much training six days a week, and uh, they would have a prescribed session every day. They wear heart rate monitors, and then they upload their session, and then the coach would view that. We use a software program called Training Peaks, and you just upload your, your training to that program and then he takes a look. And then over time, you get a really good picture of, you know, your physical development, but also like your ability to recover, your ability to train through and so that. So, so it means that we can refine then what kind of workload we can put on the athletes coming into a, a major regatta. You know, we can say, well, actually, you know, little Johnny doesn't actually recover too quickly from the hard session. So we need to start tapering earlier or whatever, you know. So and then we that all gets tied in with what are the peak events for the year? Because some of the events that we go to and um, we're using them as train through events. So that means, you know, we're not really looking at the results. We're looking at other skills to develop. And, you know, while they're while they're there, they'll still be doing their physical training. Whereas if they're at a world championships, which generally will be a peak event the physical side of what they'll do during the week of the worlds will be the the actual sailing rather than physical training itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, and and, and uh, the the sort of exercise they do is that all in the gym or? Uh, it's a mix. Is they do mix? they do a lot of cycling. Uh, if you go to any sort of international sailing regatta, you you could be mistaken for thinking you're at a cycling event because they all have really good road bikes. They spend a lot of time building up their endurance on the on the road bikes. But then they do um, like a lot of kind of mobility work as well and, as, and strength and conditioning in the gym. But they'd be working on unstable platforms like wobble boards and Swiss balls, okay. and all that sort of stuff. Because when they're on the water, you know, the, the sea is an unstable platform and they're standing on their boat. So, they're, so the gym, while we do use the gym, we try and replicate what it is that they will be facing when they're on the boat. Yeah, yeah. And do you use any like slightly more alternative things like yoga or tai chi or any of those kind of things there's there'd be some on some of the recovery days yoga would be what was be prescribed like you'd be doing you know your uh your yoga stretches and stuff like that yeah so it's not it's not necessarily like we don't have a yoga teacher as such but like on a, a like a recovery session would be basically a yoga session right and and what about diet? Are they on a like super special diet? Um. Yeah. I mean, the boats. There's no there's no weight limits as such. The way say boxing has like your different divisions of weight, and um, there's none yeah. of that in sailing. But in fact, if you want to be competitive, there there really is a a, a boundary of you know where, where the competitive uh, line is. So in fact, uh, it is a weight sensitive sport because it obviously. Um, you know, any any excess weight you're carrying that isn't being used to keep the boat flat is slowing the boat down. So um, the diet and all that sort of stuff is pretty important. And, you know, we, we work with a, a dietitian from the Institute of Sport in Ireland and he would be advising the, the athletes on, you know, what's the best uh, combination of food to be eating and stuff like that. So it is, it is pretty important. Right. I mean... If you think about it, the, the amount of calories they're burning every day and the amount of exercise they're doing, they need they need food to recover. The food is their is, is literally their fuel. Yeah. So um, I I live in the country here, and there's a, like a procession of cyclists go by every weekend. Um, so just uh, on the off chance that any of those kind of amateur people are listening, um, do do you have any tips like for? Uh, the not so much cyclists because I imagine that your coaching skills, are, you know, are applicable to most sports. So, what's your what are your top tips, James, for the amateur cyclists? <laughs> well, just anybody, you know, runners, all, because a lot of people are involved in in lots of different things, amateur on an amateur level, and you've got a very high level prof- professional, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, skill set. Yeah, um, I'd say, I mean the. The key is regular, uh, you know, doing it regularly. Um, if you can kind of avoid trying to do it in blitzes, um, you just doing the exercise regularly is, is the key thing. 
And then, right. he, and that, that includes on the days when you're maybe not getting out on the bike or doing, you know, going to the gym, do your stretching, you know, do, do the stretching that you're, you know, on the foam rollers and with the tennis balls and stuff like that. Do all those exercises if you're watching TV or whatever that. And the other big thing I'd say for the amateur uh, cyclists is, um, there's a, I think there's an over-reliance on, on sports drinks and gels and bar, energy bars and stuff like that. Um, right. And that's the, you know, that's because the, the big companies are so successful at uh, marketing these as a, as a necessary. But, you know, if you're doing, you know, between a one and a two hour cycle, you, you should really just be drinking water. You don't need uh, all these sugary, high sugar content gels and all that sort of stuff. So it's different if you're if you're out sort of six and seven and eight hours, you obviously do need more fuel, but that that's the thing for the for the amateurs that just be careful of like you know the, the the energy gels and all those sort of stuff i think are really more for full-time athletes right uh, they always strike me as being very chemical like full of chemicals more than well they're full you know, of like sugar for start, they're full or, of sugar for starters you know so yeah yeah you know um i i just be wary of uh, you know over reliance on those because they, they give you a kick there's no doubt about it but like I say, if you're if you're doing sort of between one and probably even three hours, like I, I was cycling there as you saw my red face before we started out here, you know, and I did a two hour cycle, you know, I've done a set of sort of twenty sprints uh, in that two hours, and you know, I've just been drinking uh, water, two I had whatever, two and a half liters of water um, in the two hours, um, and that's it. And, um, and I'm sorry, of, by the uh, way, I'm speaking as a yeah. as a Joe Soap when I say that because while I'm involved in high performance sport, um, I'm I'm the manager. I'm not the I'm not the performing athlete. So I would consider myself in the same uh, vein as the amateur cyclists that you see <laughs> cycling around Kerry. But obviously, I have a an inside track into what the top guys are doing. But uh, I'm I'm not I'm just doing this for my own health. I'm not doing it for sort of performance as such. Yeah, mind you now, I I think I've been a bit uh, humble there because I saw I don't know where I saw somewhere that you were you were you were just casually mentioning oh yeah we were on a hundred and thirty k cycle uh, with the team is that right Yeah 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 we did that well, that's, did that's, you see the picture that's that's that accompanied it I was clapping <laughs> yeah. on the ground with my sailors <laughs> yeah. taking pictures like, uh, of the manager uh, I do a uh, oh that's right with the groin strain yeah. yes. <laughs> Um, I do a, a race. Uh, not a, it's not a race. It's more of a tour in uh, Tuscany uh, called Laroica, and it's uh, it? sorry with the old bikes. Yeah, it's a vintage thing. I mean, I was just smiling when you were talking about gel packs and stuff because um, all the bikes have to be older than 1986. And uh, at the at the pit stops, there's none of that stuff. No energy drinks. It's wine, ham, bread. All the stuff they used to have uh, in, in, when uh, in the olden days uh, in, in racing, but um, the last one, I, the last time I did, I didn't do it last year. I did the year before. It was uh, I went up a kind of grey. There's four different um, circuits that you can do, and I did the um, 85k one. And my God, it nearly killed me. So uh, you kind of casually doing 130k. That's uh, I think you're a bit a bit above the old amateur there, James. <laughs> And um, the other thing I wanted to ask you on behalf of the amateurs uh, is the carb thing. Is that a real thing? You know, like coming up because like they have a lot of tours down here. There's the tour of Kerry. There's the, there's the tour of the Bear Peninsula. And there's all like lots of tours um, to do with cycling going on. And there's marathons, running marathons and all sorts of races. Is it a good idea to carb up, you know, the day before or coming up to a, a, an event like that? Yeah, it's funny you should ask me because I don't know if you saw but on my Twitter and stuff like that, but I, I've, and I'm speaking personally here, not professionally, and, and I think I suppose that's important to delineate because in my personal life, I have, I, I basically have a very low carb diet. So I follow a low, a low carb, uh, high fat diet. And the reason I, I kind of investigated this whole uh, way of eating was because uh, in October, what are we now? Twenty October twenty thirteen. I was coming up to forty, and I decided to get my cholesterol and everything done. My my dad died when I was pretty young, and he actually died in a sailing accident. Right. But the reason 
because it was an accident, they did a post mortem, and then they felt that uh, the post mortem basically said that they, he probably had a heart attack, but because he was on the water, his official cause of death was drowning. So I said, do you, do you know this blue September promotion <clears throat> about like men's health? Oh yeah. So I was yeah. looking at that and I went, do you know what? I'll go and get a full health check. And um, even though I felt I was very healthy, and I, I actually, you know, w- you know, was very healthy. But anyway, I went and got my bloods done in October, and my cholesterol was through the roof. And right. uh, basically, the doctor kind of uh, said, "Look, you need to go on statins." And statins are, are are basically for life. But I was kind of reluctant to do that um, without first of all seeing what I could do myself. You know, without. Yeah, investigation alternatives. So, I, you know, he said to me, "Well, look, go on them for three months, and we'll see where we're at." So I went on them for three months, but in in the in that three months, I also did a load of research, and I came across this guy in South Africa who I'd already met in sports science circles. A guy called Tim Noakes. He was an exercise physiologist, but he'd also suffered diabetes himself, and right. got into uh, this low carb, high fat diet. And uh, I decided uh, after three months, I got another blood test and my, my bloods, they went down a little bit. But then in, in the process of my research, I just sort of discovered that, and it's now actually come out as, as widely accepted. It's in like medical, British Medical Journal and all this stuff. But the, the, using cholesterol as your uh, measure of your risk of heart attack is a very poor measure of the actual probability. And what you're supposed yeah. to do is look at the ratios. So you look at the ratios of your triglycerides to your HDLs and, and your LDLs, yeah. and, and that's what becomes important. But, e- right, yeah. but even with, even knowing that, looking at my ratios, my ratios were awful. So my profile was, <laughs> was of somebody that was going to have a very high risk of a heart attack. So right. I basically then launched myself into this uh, low-carb diet, high-fat um, and completely have transformed my blood profiles in a year. So I did another test at the end of the year and I've got all my ratios into, into like the norms and, you know, it's safe in terms of the, your metabolic uh, characteristics. So I, I'm a big, big advocate of the, the low carb. Um, and I would say, I mean, if the, if the race is next week, just keep doing what you're doing. There's no point changing something, you know, a, a week out. But uh, I suppose that's why that's why I was saying your, you know, your average kind of guy in the street is eating too much carbs, and you know, right. then when they add exercise into that and all the sugar and all the gels and everything like that, they're even eating yeah. more carbs than they need to. So um, yeah. I I am not a fan of carbo loading um, at all. Um, right. But that said. For a high, you know, a high level intense intense athletes, like say a rugby player or something, they need to have more carbs, but they burn them off immediately, you know, because they're they're so active. So it's a it's a it's a really interesting um, development now. I mean, sport sport never stands still, you know. I mean, if you're doing, I mean, we kind of talk about it in the team, you know, the level that our sailors are at now, if they were racing in the Olympics in 96, they'd probably all be winning gold medals. But this, right. it just all evolves. It keeps evolving, keeps evolving, you know. And so yeah. the, the, the latest kind of, I suppose the biggest area that's evolving at the moment is sports nutrition. And, the you know, this whole low-fat, um, or sorry, high-fat, low-carb diet is and now you're specific about the particular kind of fats that you take in yeah some, some fats are better than others yeah, yeah exactly so it's it's all like saturated fat it's it's animal fat um it's all like avocados uh that sort of stuff and it's the big mistake people make is it's not it's not a high protein diet so it's not like you're eating big steaks but you're eating you're eating steak with the with the fat on it you know the, the steak is kind of like you know you shouldn't be eating too much meat either but um, it's kind of ironic because if you think that you know you're always advised to eat a balanced diet, but what our perception of a balanced diet is nowadays is totally imbalanced. I mean, if you think how much bread, rice, and pasta people eat, carbohydrate mm-hmm. is a massive part of people's diet. So it's not balanced yeah. at all, even though they're eating 
all the food types. So it's just, I mean, as I say, I am not a nutritionist, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking <laughs> from a, a very much a personal point of view on this one. But, you know, yeah. I, I haven't had to take statins. My doctor is just like, you know, he's now fascinated by this because I did this kind of quietly by myself, did the bloods, you know, you know, did them sort of before, during and after. And I'll go back regularly, you know, I'll still, you know, go back to the doctor and get my bloods done now when I get back from Spain and just make sure I'm on track. But um, it's been very, very, very interesting. And I've lost it. I mean, as a byproduct, uh, I was 84 kilos on the 1st of January 2014. And, you know, I kind of felt... I don't mind around Christmas. I always used to put on a little bit of weight and then I got back down to around sort of, you know, uh, 80, 81, but I kind of felt, you know, 78 would be, would be my kind of weight where I'd want to be. And I'm 75 yeah. kilos now and I'm a steady right. 75 kilos, you know, and I, I right. eat as much as I want of, of that type of food, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a similar experience myself with the with the statins. There's a history of um, heart trouble in my own family. My, my father died of a heart attack, um, and uh, I, I was about four years ago. The same thing, just you know, went along, and they were like, "Oh, your blood pressure is too high, and your your cholesterol is too high. Yeah. And try this out, and whatever." Um, and now I didn't go into it in the same way as you did. I, I sort of number one, I without I didn't. It didn't happen straight away, but I eventually I just stopped drinking <laughs> yeah. altogether. Uh, not not because I was afraid of it or anything like that. I just, what was going on for me at the same time kind of happened in parallel. And, um, and then just the physical thing of waking up every morning and having to take this pill, you yeah, know, I remember yeah. sitting on the side of the bed and going... I'm, this is like an affirmation of sickness. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, this pill is telling me there's something wrong with me, and I don't think there is. So after about six months, I just stopped taking them myself. Now, I know you're not supposed to do that, and you're supposed to go and do it in consultation with your doctor, but like I just did it in consultation with myself and what my inner sense of it was. But uh, that, and then... Um, what else did we do? We, we uh, went... We, we've gone to a plant-based diet, so we're, like, technically we're vegans. And um, I... I the same thing I eventually when you know you have to go in and 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 get checked and uh, the last time I I was in getting checked the the nurse was saying to me are you sure you're supposed to be here because everything had just come back into the the, into the ranges yeah uh, you know I I must send you um I must send you this this uh, this guy called Ivor Cummins he's kind of a a engineer by training but he's very into all this um so the 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 low carb stuff and his twitter handle is the fat emperor but (laughs) <laughs> and he, he, I kind of took a, a little bit of advice from him because the guy I was following in South Africa, and I, was, uh, I realized that Ivor was Irish. And I was sort of saying to him, look, is there any doctors or whatever that you know in Ireland that, that you could recommend? Um, but then as it happened, I just stuck with my own doctor because he was pretty open-minded. Like he was a young guy and he was kind of like, yeah, look, let's, let's see where we go. So and yeah. the results came in and, you know, it, it's interesting like some of the the physios and strength and conditioning guys now are, are doing the diet as well, having kind of like slagged me a bit at first about what was going on. But um, I'll send you on. Ivor did a, a bit of a, uh, an article on, on me. He, do, he kind of runs his own, he does blogs and stuff on all of this. And he, I suppose he, he was involved when I got my first blood profile and the statins and stuff like that. So he kind of did a summary oh, piece, yeah, do, a piece do on it. Send, send it to me and I'll put it in the uh, show notes so everyone oh, yeah. can have a, yeah, have a look cool. at it as well. Um, so going back to like athletes in general, do you think that you've, uh, like, because as well as the Irish team, you will have been around a lot of athletes and you've been to a lot, you've been like, you've been into the kind of workings of the Olympics in a way that, uh, most people wouldn't have. Do you, do you think that there's a, a quality about a champion? Is there any defining thing that you've noticed that sort of stands out? Um, well, just the, I suppose it's the incredible focus, you know, and it's the, you know, I suppose, I, I've seen the sailors come through. So it's, you know, the, I suppose, you know, there's, there's, there is no such thing as an overnight success. I mean, the amount of work that goes into just even getting to the Olympics and then, you know, getting to the Olympics and then actually, you know, meddling at the Olympics is another different level again. So, I mean, that that's the... 
that's the characteristic that I suppose stands out the most. It's just the the absolute sort of focus and determination to to achieve a goal, you know, regardless of what happens. Because you know, the the other thing that people don't realize is that the, like the Olympic Games is never perfect. You know, you you have this idea in your head that you know I'm going to do this event. It's I you know I've been waiting all my life to do it. It's going to be absolutely perfect, and it never is. There's always stuff that will happen, and it's. It's kind of like the person who reacts best to, you know, all the plans that don't go well that that comes out on top. If you know what I mean, and it sounds a bit uh, backwards, but that that's kind of the reality that that I've discovered at Olympics. So it's the ability to adapt on the in the moment, really. Yeah, exactly, and and just to sort of, you know, yeah, exactly. I mean, that 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 sums that up. But I mean, that all goes hand in hand with. You know, for for a sailing medalist, generally they'll have spent eight years getting to that point. You know, you know, as a senior athlete, it's very very rare in our sport that they medal at the first games. All right. The the reason I ask is that from from the outside watching the Olympics, particularly the 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 sort of superstars, you kind of have the impression that they have this extra quality that they almost glow. <laughs> You know, like the Hussein Bolts and the Michael Phelpses and all that kind of thing. But what you're saying is, is, is not not necessarily the case. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I, I think. I mean, the media have a lot to. You know, this the the the, the romantic story always sells more st- more newspapers and stuff like that. So that the, these yeah. people are characterised and they're they're made into caricatures. But you know, at the end of the day, they're they're just human beings. They have ups and downs. They have their hard days where. You know, they don't feel like going training, but your champion is the one who gets out of bed and like goes training. And you know, yeah. actually, Usain Bolt is interesting. He, if you follow him, like I mean, he, he's put up some of his training sessions, and you know, it, it's really gritty the stuff they're putting up, and it, it's it's what it's like. I mean, he's putting up sessions where you know he's doing a sprint and he's puking into a bucket, and then he's you know taking his thirty second rest or his minute rest, and then he's doing another sprint. You know, and he's absolutely yeah. dying. He's physically dying and, you know, I mean, he just has the, the will to, he knows that if he gets through this, he's tougher, he's tougher for it, you know? Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's what it is. I mean, in sailing, it's a bit like, you know, you're, you're at home and over the winter and, you know, you're, it's, it's minus three and it's going to, it feels like minus 14 and it's windy and it's hailstones, but you go out training, you know? Yeah. Um, because and because you know by training you mean count. in a boat on the water yeah, yeah exactly exactly oh, God. <laughs> so yeah it's it's an ability to kind of like you know accept that there will be delayed gratification for the for the hard work that you're putting in you know yeah brilliant um now you're i um, you're you'll be focused on the olympics in rio uh i imagine you're all focused on that that's next year um, I read somewhere that there was a sewerage problem there that that you were a bit concerned about for the the, the sailing. Has that been sorted out? Do you think or no, 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 it still hasn't. worried um, about it? Yeah, it's, it's it's not so much worried. Um, in, in terms of like, it, it, there's two things with it. Like the there's there's a, there's a pollution problem in the water, which you know you initially you kind of have concerns around the safety of the athletes and is it is it going to be. You know, is there a health risk? And and we're we're fairly confident now that there is no health risk. Um, even though it's unpleasant to sail in, it's it's you know it's not going to cause anyone uh, diseases or anything like that. And then the secondary problem is the actual garbage in in the water. That the rubbish in the water can tag on to the the rudders and the and the keels which are underneath our boats. Yeah. And if you catch a plastic bag or something like that, it, it drastically reduces your speed and they're tricky enough to get off. And yeah. that's and where your, then your the rudders are long, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of yeah. they, they're different in each boat, but they, they're they long enough to, to pick up a plastic bag, you know, floating yeah, below the yeah. water level or stuff like that. So that's where then the racing becomes a bit unfair. You know, if you're yeah. doing really well in a race and, you know, through no fault of your own, you pick up a plastic bag. Um, and yeah. That is still a big concern. Now we, we're, we've, you know, the world governing body for sailing is called ISAF, and you know they've they've been working very closely with the Brazilian authorities to try and get this resolved, and they've put an additional course area now outside Guanabara Bay. So, um, you know, we have an option to be racing outside the harbour, which in a way would be a shame because, you know, 
for example, in Sydney, we were racing inside the harbour and sailing was a real spectacle of the Olympics because you had all yeah. the people on the on the cliff edges and stuff like that. So it was like a natural nature's kind of amphitheatre for sailing. And Rio is very yeah. similar like that, that if we're racing in the bay, it, it, you know, we'd almost be centrepiece of the of the games, which is pretty cool. But yeah, because um, normally sailing is always on a satellite town, you know, like in yeah, China, yeah. we were two hour flight away and same in, in London, we were down in Weymouth. Yeah, yeah. The pollution thing is something else that I read. Um, I read a post by I can't remember his name now, but he was that young uh, New Zealand guy who sailed around the world 10 years ago. I think he was the youngest person to ever sail around the world. And he recently did it again 10 years later. And he was saying that the difference in the ocean was uh, shocking to him that the, uh, he, the I think the tagline on the, the article was the ocean is broken. Yeah. Um, you, you know what I'm talking about? Have, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. So because you mix in, in uh, sailing circles, have, apparently like it's it's really only apparent to sailors who are sailing through these um, oceans that normally you wouldn't sail through. Uh, have you come across this yourself? Or not, I don't mean personally, but you know, uh, know people or heard about it? No, not in the ocean, but I mean, you know, I mean, the, we were in Perth in 2011 and you know, Western Australia is a pretty remote place and rubbish was the problem on the race course there. Like they, they had to have, they had trawlers kind of with uh, essentially rakes towing behind them that were sort of clearing the, the metal race area, you know, each morning. So, yeah. you know, when you think somewhere as remote as Western Australia, you know, has a, a gets a rubbish problem, you know, it, it doesn't reflect too well on humanity. Yeah, no, this guy was saying that, I think it was in the Pacific, the South Pacific, around that that kind of area near Australia, that uh, there's just these big um, masses of rubbish just floating. Uh, a lot yeah. of it came from uh, the, the tsunami that washed into into uh, Japan, apparently. But he right. was saying the lack of uh, bird life was shocking to him. And just fish and what was, you know, was very abundant 10 years ago is was very dead now. According to this yeah. Way, anyway, yeah, no, I, I can't say I've noticed that level of detail where yeah. where we race, but yeah, I mean, I mean, there's no doubt the bay is polluted in Rio because it's you know it's such a huge city and it has I think it's got over a hundred rivers that flow into it, and then you get like storm surge where basically oh, yeah. when it rains, all of the the crap from the the flavelas and the surrounding you know urban areas flow into the rivers, which then flows into the bay, so pretty grim okay we'll we'll change change direction a little bit um so you're you've got this great job coach of the of the irish uh, sailing team you've got uh your wife and you've got two little girls and you have a nice house in uh, a nice suburb in dublin and then you decide to move to spain for a year what's what's that all about james <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it was it was actually um it's kind of a a dream that we both had independently before we met each other. And then, you know, we're, we're together 10 years now, but we, we sort of sort of said, said to each other, Oh, you know, I've always would have liked to have lived in Spain for a, a bit and learn the language and get it part of the culture. And, you know, Sharon had the same view and the world championships for the, the, the main qualifier for Rio was in Santander um, in 2014. And we, I kind of originally had thought that in the year leading up to that, we, as a team, we would have spent a lot of time in Santander. So at, at that stage, I discussed with Sharon, you know, what do you think about moving to Spain for a year? And, we, you know, we got really excited about it. We discussed it all through and everything like that. And then, you know, I didn't want to make it, I wanted it to work for my job as well. I mean, that was very important because, you know, obviously everyone has, Everyone has kind of things they want to do, but, uh, you know, real life is important as well. So, I, I, you know, I wanted to make sure work were happy with it. But, and then as it transpired with the way the competition schedule was working, we actually weren't as a team going to be spending that much time in Santander. Is Santander in Spain? It is actually. Yeah, exactly. OK, so, yeah. so this, this was now we would have been proposing to sort of move out there in October 2013 up until the world's in September 2014. And, you know, it turned out we weren't going to be based there that much as a team. So we, and then also our youngest daughter was sort of, uh, what age was she then? She was just kind of one. So we, we shelved it and we kind of then banned each other talking about 
because we got so pissed off with each other for getting so excited and, you know, then canning the idea. So, you know, both of us hate this whole thing where you just keep talking about something and then you never do it. So it was off, off limits. And then we went on holidays in July, um, 2014 when we were in the Alps with some with some friends and we went out for dinner just Sharon and I went out for dinner we kind of swapped one night they went out for dinner and we sat in with their kids and vice versa so we were sitting there and I just said over the dinner I said can't get that Spain thing out of my head so it was like you know about eight months later and then Sharon just went me neither so then we got got started talking about it all again and uh, I was like right let's do it you know so we agreed that we were going to explore it and find out and do it if we could so uh you know for for us for, from a professional point of view i mean there's, there's pros and cons personally and professionally but the, the the pros from a professional point of view were we we always come down to cadiz for the winter anyway to train so the guys because it'll come down to winter come down to cadiz sorry in the october midterm and they're coming out until basically the first week of april and what used to happen is I would go out to camps and sort of check in with everyone and then fly home. I'd leave Sharon and, and the kids in Dublin. Um, so we just decided, look, why don't we just turn this on its head so that I'll be out for camps, but I'll fly back to Dublin every you know six weeks or whatever, whatever needs to be done uh, and do three or four days of meetings and leave Sharon and the kids in Spain instead of Dublin. So we just literally turned the thing on its head and... You know, I, I spoke with the sports council about it. I spoke with um, the Irish Sailing Association about it. And, you know, everybody was kind of, in, in fact, it was a much bigger deal in my head than it was in their head. Most people were kind of like, well, you know, when you've explained the logic of it, you know, how come you haven't done it sooner was kind of the attitude. So everyone was very supportive, <laughs> which was which was really good because, you know, I absolutely love my job. And I do feel I do feel it's a privilege to you know be manager of a of, of the national team, and I didn't want to impose my personal desire uh, you know on the on the job for that reason. And, and yeah, I understand. To the, point, yeah. to the point where I didn't tell my coaches that this is what I was thinking until you know I wanted them to propose what, what their program was and what their training was, you know before I told them I'm going to be in Cadiz, I wanted them to already be thinking, right, well, we're going to Cadiz, you know? So I did it that way and it it worked out pretty well. So it's been great. So we've had the various sailors here throughout the winter and, you know, it's, I've been much more at the coal face, you know, than I usually would, you know, and then the downside is I'm I'm maybe not as on top of the office stuff as I normally would be, but, you know, and then obviously from a personal point of view, it's been just amazing. Uh, we got Sky, uh, our eldest daughter, turned uh, four in October, just before we left. And she started school within two weeks of us getting here. She was in the local pu- in the local public school, and she's now chatting away in Spanish, and you know understands it really well. And then we were back in Ireland for Christmas, and then kind of our main goal for the second half was to get live into. Um, like a crash to, to sort of have yeah. company of kids her own age. And we've just looked out on that as well. We found this amazing uh, crash. So she's in crash every morning now from, from nine to one. Um, so it's just been, uh, you know, I suppose it's a long answer to your question, but it's, uh, you know, it's one of these things, Sky, Sky starts school in Ireland next September. And we just felt, you know what, if we don't do this now, it's going to be basically when the kids are growing up and we're retired when we do something like this or, you know, yeah, so yeah. let's do it. And, and was it uh, always, always Spain or just to yeah. go somewhere else? Always no, it was Spain. always Spain. Always Spain. What, what is it about Spain do you think that you both like so much? Um, well, I, I, did Sp- I did Spanish in school, so, and I did, uh, you know, Spanish exchanges. And then Sharon uh, traveled in South America and she, she kind of learned Spanish when she was out there herself. And, you know, the, also from a it's a very familial country like they're very very much into the family and family life and that was attractive to us as well and you know you see it's kind of bizarre i mean the kids are out uh, at all hours you know and but it's really nice as well you know so that that was one of the the main reasons for spain right because we wanted to to learn the language as well because we had 
we both had reasonable Spanish, but wanted to get good at it. So we, you know, we get we have a lesson here once a week, and you know, we're we're doing our best to kind of converse with the locals. But funnily enough, Andalusia has a particular kind of uh, accent where they lisp. And they also kind of, they, they, oh, yeah. they eat their words is what they say. So, you know, whereas we'd say gracias, they say gracia. Or two, two years oh, is right. dos años, so they go do año. So it's, and it's really, it's right. funny because Sky has it down to a T. So Sky will, Sky will correct <laughs> us if we do a pronunciation wrong. <laughs> so, um, so your wife, Sharon, is an artist, right? Um, and there's a kind of view that, uh, the greatest kind of form of art is your your life. Your you know that's that's your like the main work of art uh, that yeah. you create. Do do you uh, think that this like move to Spain, which uh, you know I mean a lot of people would talk about doing something like that, but very few people would actually do it. Do you think that that do you look at that as a kind of a, a creative uh, expression for yourself? Um, yeah, we do, and it's something we're very proud of. Like we've both congratulated each other on doing this because it's like you say I mean <laughs> Facebook is full of these things of, of like how to live your life and do this and do that and it's kind of like I, I gave up Facebook about a year and a half ago because just you know you find you're looking at people's lives and uh, just not living your own in a way you can fall into that trap you know and I just we just, both just felt yeah let's do this this is you know, one of those things on those lists is, you know, live in a foreign country for a while, learn a foreign language, you know, all this sort of stuff. So let's yeah. do it. So, yeah, we do feel like it's, a, you know, a, a kind of a growth for, for us as a family and, and, and the experience and that. It's like, you know, it's, it's, our, it's our little family adventure. And so, yeah, I, I would say it's a sort of creative for us. And it's something that we're going to treasure for, for the rest of our lives, you know. I jokingly say to Sharon, right. I said, Sharon, we're fucked now when we get home. And she goes, what do you mean? So we have no dream now. We've done our dream, you know. So, <laughs> I was going to say that to you. How is yeah. it going to be? You're going to have withdrawal. Exactly. Because I mean, I, I have every four years, like I've been to whatever, I think four, four Olympics anyway. And every four years, I, like I know what's going to happen. And I can't prevent it, even though I know it's going to happen. But... The Olympics finishes and I fall off a cliff because you're you're so focused for that four years in the build up to that that it takes me until sort of Christmas, you know, you know, even after London it was probably February, before I feel that I'm back energized and ready to ready to do this again. It's 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 so all consuming. Um so that's what I sort of say, like, you know, we, we're, we're now doing one of the things we've spoken about for eight or nine years. What are we going to do when it's all over? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, is it going to be over? Do you think you'd stay there now? Um, we've had that discussion, actually. And uh, no, we, 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 we would, but we won't. Um, like we, it's not like we, yeah. we, we absolutely love Ireland. And, and obviously Sharon is from Bristol, so... You know, she 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 has moved to Ireland, and Ireland is her home now, and she loves it, and we love our life there, and everything like that. So, and 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 obviously with the kids, we want we want the we want the kids in school in in, in Ireland. We've the uh, skies and the local educate together, and we 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 kind of were quite keen to get into that school. Um, so yeah, we've you know, and then the other thing is you know the the adventure is amazing because. In a way, we, we we get a lot of protection from the the normal, I suppose, stress and emotion surrounding emigration. For us, that's none of that is an issue because we know we're coming back. Whereas I have friends, you know, who've, yeah. who've gone to Canada, and like I can only imagine that you know they they see their families now once a year if they're lucky, you know, and that's tough. And like Skype is great and all that sort of stuff, but um we don't have any of that stress or strain because we know we're here for nine months. So it's almost like a nine month holiday, you know, obviously I'm working, but, yeah. um, you know, when I finish work, you know, we're, we're, we can go, like we, we can go to the beach. We can do things as if you're on holidays in Spain. So it's pretty cool like that. And then the other thing is like, I don't know if you read the blog, like Billy no mates. I mean, I have no friends here. I have people that I'm acquaintances with, but you know, I don't have, besides my wife, 
you know, I don't have any mates, but I'm pretty comfortable with that in the knowledge that, you know, I'm here for nine months, you know, and it's not likely that I'm not open yeah. to making friends, but that's the thing when you move to a different place that takes the longest, you can't force that, you know, you can't force friendship. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 we're, we're definitely coming back, you know? Right. Well, that prob knowing that you're going back would probably make it easier. I mean, coming up with the new dream, I'd, I don't think no, you'll have a problem. I, I, I guess as well when I say that. I mean, I, I don't think we'll have it. We have a couple of ideas already, so. Ah, uh, good. Well, we'll, we'll uh, keep, uh, keep uh, an eye on it. Um, right, so slightly a different direction again now. Have you kept up uh, with the, have you kept up an interest in uh, economics? Because, you know, you studied it. Do you? Yeah, yeah. What do you think of with the how the global e economy is going? Are you interested in that? Anymore? I was, and then I and then I just felt, particularly in the in the recession in Ireland, I got to a point where I just thought, you know what, I am I am absorbing too much negativity here. You know, when you were looking at prime time, mm. you're looking at the news, like you know, like everybody was becoming an economist. Basically, everybody had an opinion. And I, you know, yeah. it, you you almost felt powerless to do anything about it, um, and you were watching your country kind of uh, basically fall down the drain. You know, um, I remember coming back from um, Beijing basically, and then it was that was in '08, and you know, feeling feeling a sense of shame actually that you know that we'd basically been taken over by the IMF and the and the troika. That you know we're we're out there yeah. representing our country, and you kind of feel Jesus, you know we we've totally failed ourselves as a country here, and you know we're we're there wearing our tracksuits with Ireland on it, and you're you know you're a proud Irishman, and you just feel like Jesus, this is a total screw up, you know. <laughs> so so you think we shouldn't have paid the bondholders? You think Absolutely we should have gone not. to like uh, Iceland? That yeah, well, I, 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 and and simply because. I'm a believer in a free market economy, but you know, and the free market economy basically should have been allowed to fail. But the, you know, these people that talk about, oh, you know, free the market will decide. I agree with that, but there needs to be regulation clearly. But they didn't let the market decide because the market would have burnt these guys. So all of these people saying that look, the free market economy is the way to go. That experiment was never let happen. So we don't know if free market economics works, you know. Yeah. And um, it's still just a theory, really, because you know, basically the the bankers and whoever got it both ways. They they had their free market and they made loads of money, but then when it went tits up, the government had to intervene, which isn't free market eco economics, you know. Yeah. Do you do you think the Icelandic model, if more countries had adopted it, it would have gained a bit more momentum? I mean, I, I feel I feel a bit of a fraud talking too much about this because, it, you know, it's not my area of expertise. You know, I, that's all right. It's not mine either. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I did study economics, and I had this amazing experience with economics where I remember in first year I didn't do economics for my leaving, but I remember in first year at the first Christmas test, I got my exam back. You know. And I opened it up and I'd got 7%. And the guy beside me bursts out laughing. I ba <laughs> barely know the guy. And he taps the guy on the shoulder on his other side and goes, he got 7%. And I was just thinking, what an ignorant git. Like, who the hell does he think he is? Like, I'm feeling pretty bad here. And then he got his paper back and he got 4%. <laughs> so all of a sudden I was delighted. And actually we became quite friendly with each other. But anyway, I got on the on my finals. Like I worked really, really hard for my finals. But in my finals, I, I was I studied monetary economics, which is a lot about what you know the the, the the big picture economics. So a lot about like what the government need to do and all the rest. And I studied it. I studied it. I studied it. And I just found it. It was so complex. And then for the week of my exams, it all clicked. I had just absolute clarity on what happens if this happens you know yeah. and i just missed getting a first in monetary economics you know i got like 68 or 69 and um, so i was absolutely delighted but i would say probably five weeks after 
try to get me to explain it again, there's no way. <laughs> well, I think so. I think what's one of the things that's come out of the particularly the the failure and that kind of subprime thing was that for my, for your average kind of person uh, who who wouldn't have your training. Um, they would kind of go, oh, what's a subprime and a, oh, well, well, you know, well, that's all very complicated. And I'm sure they know what they're doing. And after it all blew up uh, in everyone's faces, I think there was a general thing of like, you know, it's that thing like if, if it feels wrong or, you know, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So if it feels like someone's bullshitting you, then I don't need to know the economic theory yeah. behind it. That's just wrong. <laughs> Yeah, And I think a lot of people now just feel like their sense of things, uh, economic wise, uh, regardless of whether they have the, you know, the, the knowledge to back it up, uh, they're much more uh, encouraged to just go, well, that just that just seems like the wrong thing to do. Um, yeah. And they're quite comfortable yeah. with that, you know. So I know that's why I'm quite comfortable talking about it, because it affects everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, world, you, know? you know, I was I was really interested in it when I was all breaking, but then I just found, you know what, you know, I've got my family, I've got my kids, and just focus on the uh, on being happy in our in our own self because it was so easy to get sucked into the negativity, you know. Yeah, well, that, trying to be happy in Ireland it was a full time job. I, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about, and required a lot of focus. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, so I kind of like I've kind of started to delve back into it a little bit but just conscious that you know what my life is a lot better not tuning yeah. into the news and to prime time every day um, and yeah. so yeah it, yeah yeah it's a funny one but the, you probably had the same experience that i've had and i think probably everybody like not just in ireland that it it has affected everybody like it's affected like everybody knows people has people in their family uh, who's who it has affected it like a lot of me a lot of media stories are bullshit really and don't yeah. really affect anyone but certainly all this the economic downturn in ireland and i think worldwide you know everyone is uh, if not affected personally they know somebody at least one person who it has been affected by yeah yeah big time big time so do you think like considering the environmental issues and the the general uh, engine or that what's supposed to keep like uh capitalism going is growth 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 it has to grow or else it sort of stalls do you yeah. think it's sustainable no no i don't no. yeah i don't um, either and that's where actually that was kind of my experience in sale coach you know was we were being pushed by the banks and the investment growth 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 and then, like I say, we believed our own hype, but like we were growing on their on grants, you know, not on genuine income. So yeah. growth, 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 growth isn't necessarily a good thing. You know, sustainability is a much, much more admirable uh, goal. And if, if you grow in a sustainable way, well, then great. But some things, you know, it won't grow, you know. Yeah. And um, there's, an, there's an optimum point where, where they, they should just sort of become better at what they do but not necessarily grow if you know what i mean yeah yeah have you come across um sacred economics the sort of gift economy that whole idea uh no i haven't actually oh yeah it's very it's quite it's it's like a complete alternative model it's basically going the growth thing is not going to work and it's it's set to implode and the environmental uh issues that are happening are as a result of just keep I've, I've just think continually thinking well, we have to grow we have to grow more consume more and more and more um so that's obviously not going to work uh, and here's an alternative uh, I, I mean i won't go into it now but it, yeah it's quite it's quite interesting uh, it's, it's called uh, sacred economics and charles okay. eisenstein is the main kind of uh, guy kind of talking about it yeah so <laughs> this might seem like a funny kind of question if you were coaching uh, the irish economy what would you do Oh, that is a funny question. Just off you the top of your head, five, four yeah. or five things that could be done that you think would be done. <sighs> well, I mean, I think because uh, you're, you're a very you're a very successful coach, right? Yeah. So you know, and you know about econ e e economics, so you know. Well, so where where might you be start? A bit of a crossover there. <laughs> yeah, you have to start with the youth. You know, I mean, it's it's interesting, like. You know, if you're going to change attitudes, 
you, you have to start in the in the education system and you have to start with with as young as you can basically um to to affect the change but see that's where that doesn't work with with the way our political system is because you know their main interest is is winning the next general election it's not necessarily you know long term development so it's a tricky one because that's where you're going to affect change the most is if if you if you get the education about you know you know say we're talking about capitalism and you know alternatives or whatever that's where it has to start um well that's, so that's a very like that's a very informed perspective because you see that with the the sailing coaching because the, you're saying they start at 8 or 9 or 10 and yeah. then eight, eight, you know 10 years later is when they they're qualifying for the olympics yeah but i i even see like the effects of the economy you know it or, culturally within our sailors you know i mean the, the, the there was good things about the celtic tiger i mean it gave irish people a sense of confidence that they could go out and compete in anything and that that translated to sport as well like we have a generation of kids now that you know they aren't afraid to be a world champion they aren't afraid to you know be the best at what they can be and that's yeah. different you know that is a very different like when we were sort of competing as when I, in my generation, it was like, oh, my God, look at that Australian guy, you know. And there'd be a yeah. fear there that, you know, eventually you'd overcome it. But these guys are, you know, fresh, fresh off the plane. And they're like, you know, well, we're, we're going to win this one, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's part of that is that is that sort of Celtic Tiger kind of attitude that, you know, we're going to take over the world here. So there's, there's upsides in sport as well as the downside in economics about that. I mean... The, the other sort of sentiment is, is that, you know, in a way they expect everything to be, to be there for them. So that's, that's a challenge because it's not, you know, you have to work hard to get things in life. And that, that sometimes is, you know, you, you see the difference there. So, yeah, I mean, that would be probably the biggest thing I'd, if I was coaching economics, I'd sort of go, right, you know, what's the long-term vision here? And if this is the long-term vision, the, the most effective way of changing it is to start with with the youth right very good well that was a good answer <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot there okay well, i'm gonna put you on the spot now again um if there was one thing you could pass on to future generations what would it be live your life uh you know do what you're i i always talk about my inner voice you've got i think everybody has it but um generally it's right. Do what your do what your inner voice tells you. Live your life by by that sort of honesty within. If that makes sense. Yeah. And just as an aside, what what do you think that inner voice is? It's your sense of who you are and what the right thing to do is. Right. So it's a kind of to do with everything being congruent, like everything being in alignment within you is it yeah 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 brilliant that's what i find anyway very good okay well that's been it's been great uh chatting with you james lots of very interesting stuff uh, I, i've enjoyed it um, so thanks very much for taking the time to good. Chat thanks for having me thanks for having me okay all right we'll see you then james bye bye cheers bye I've never felt this good in my entire life. Make me some spaghetti.